shows Talkback. Since those of you who know, uh, who've been with me since I started Talkbacks, I, re I love to sort of come up with some themes that allow us to deepen our experience with whatever show we're presenting. Obviously for a show like this, there's not a lot one has to do to deepen your experience, because I'm sure you're feeling like you've had a lot of experience tonight. Um, but they were so fantastic uh, to work with, and we knew, and I knew, that we wanted to be sensitive about the subject matter that comes up in the show. Um, and so over the course of the show, we've, we've talked about a lot of things, from opioid abuse to uh, the effects on the family. And tonight, because when we originally planned for this, this was the last week of the run, um, we are excited that we have extended twice over. Um, but when we began to plan this, this was the last talk back of the run. And this talk back tonight is entitled Let There Be Light, um, Wellness and Recovery. Um, because one of the things that I think this production does especially well is it doesn't necessarily leave you feeling um, down, for lack of a better term. Um, there is some hope when this production is over. Um, there is an unknowing of what the future will hold, but it does feel a little bit uh, hopeful, and so I'll pass this along to you. Uh, and so that's a, sort of the, the frame for tonight. Uh, the cast will join us as well. Uh, and then also next to Hank is Karen Kangas, who works for, tell me a little bit about where you, uh, who you work for. I work for Hartford Healthcare as well. I'm the Director of Recovery and Family Affairs. And it's kind of a newly created position. Although I did the same thing for the Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services. Nice, nice. So having seen the end of this show, uh, what are your thoughts as someone who sort of deals in wellness and recovery? Um, the wellness and recovery are, are wonderful, but I would have to tell you, having had bipolar illness myself for over 40 years, this was probably one of the most traumatic evenings I've spent <laughs> because I had to relive my life. And boy, did it bring back memories. And I can only say that um, right now I'm feeling like uh, it feels like I lived this life and now it, but it's good. Now it's happy and now there is hope and there is recovery, so it's okay. Joining us, David Harris, John Proposa, David Brown. So you guys will appreciate this a little bit. Uh, tonight's topic is Let There Be Light, Wellness and Recovery. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about that, what that feels like. Yeah. yeah I, I just want to say that Karen Kangas is the embodiment of hope. Her life was quite similar to the life saw here, but that, this is a life that has been turned towards helping and guiding people to recovery for, what, 25, 30 years? I don't know how many years, but uh, about as effectively... <laughs> <laughs> about that. <laughs> question I'm going to actually pitch to the fellas over here. Um, oftentimes people ask, how do you do this show over and over, night after night? Um, and I want you to talk a little bit about the elation um, that you guys have always surprised us with when, when you talk about how you feel when the show is over. Yeah, um, I, when we were rehearsing this, I was like, doing this eight times a week, uh, eight, eight hours a day. I was really heavy and I was like, I don't know how I'm going to get to do this eight times a week uh, and pull through to do it the next day and the next day and the next day. Um, surprisingly, it is very surprising that doing the show from A to B uh, and, and actually allowing yourself to go there emotionally, the ride is a lot easier. And there is a cathartic feeling at the end of the show. There is a, there is a light. I'm glad that number is in there. Um, we do bounce off stage and we are a cohesive group of people, which also helps. And my friends are all a very tight knit group. Uh, that helps. Um, it, it is surprising. I, I didn't think it would be as light to turn it around the next day and go again. Um, I mean, 
yes, having that cohesive group back here was certainly a big help, and um, getting to know all these guys over the course of this rehearsal process and run has been very helpful in doing the show night after night. And I think part of uh, part of that you know, sense of togetherness is when we're on stage, something that we were actually talking about earlier today is that this is a really wonderful group to be on stage with um, because there's a lot of trust. And, <laughs> and uh, Maya Kelleher. And with a piece like this, it's it, it's got to be fresh every night. You have to be willing to be there and, and receive whatever you know your your scene partner, your your cast is, is giving you that night. And it might be different from night to night, and that's what keeps this to, this that's what keeps this alive. It makes it a living, breathing piece of theater. Um, and so we're very fortunate. Yeah. If there anyone can see here, you know, Jamie's gonna come hang out with me. And sit next to his old buddy. Come on. And so we're very fortunate to, to be up here to have the group that we have. Um, I think I want to answer that too. Well, the question? question was how do you do the show the night after night? How do the show the night after night? Um, sleep as much as possible. Eat pineapple. Um, drink a lot of water. Uh, don't talk when I'm not here. Uh, FaceTime with my daughter and my husband every day. Um, and then trust these jokers all the time. <laughs> yeah, it's not, I mean, it, it's never, it, so far it has not been a chore at all. At all. I might, I might be tired and go, oh God, how, what's going to happen tonight? But the more we've done it, I feel like all of us, we might have some days where it's like, ooh, it's kind of thick today, but um, I feel like all of us are getting vocally more adept. Not um, that it's getting easier, but we're figuring out how to slalom ski down the mogul run, as it were, you know, so you figure out what to do with it. And I think that piece, that, you know, the idea that it's not a chore, both for, for your instrument, but also for your emotional life. Tonight we're talking about recovery and wellness, and so I had bounced to these guys something that I love that you say when you finish the show that you feel elated, yeah. so that there's a, a hope at the end of the show that you are that you carry with you. Yeah. You can tell me more about that. Yeah, I, I people when I was um, getting ready to come up here, people were saying, "Oh, be so careful, and you know, go crazy, and you go down to deep dark places, and blah blah blah." blah. And from the get go, I I was just like, "This, why? Like, there's." I feel bad for the family, but Diana's got her, she knows where she's going. It, there's nothing tormented about it. She, she's always exactly where she is in a really large way. It's more the perception of, of the journey. And, and the way it's written and the way it's constructed, it's, I, I mean, from the first time we ran through it, I was like, I feel so great. I can't believe I feel so good. And it was shocking. I wasn't, I wasn't expecting that. I mean. The, you know, the range of emotion is obviously very broad, but but that, that, that's not a bad thing. Before we open it up to you guys, I, I want to hear a little more from you, Christiane, about um, she knows exactly where she is. And I think, you know, in terms of wellness and recovery, it would be interesting to hear, and I don't want you to give up any of your sort of actor secrets, but where do you think she is at the end of the play? At the end, um, she's at her beginning, and I don't. I think uh, for the first time, no one else is telling her where she's supposed to be, and I think that was the big difference. The idea of um, finding out who she is, what is this, how is this work, and being okay with it, and and identifying it. And then figuring out how to survive with that, and how to exist with that. Whereas um, up until the end of the play, it's always been, no, you need to do these things because this is this is not normal. This is not the, you know we need to give you this. You need to you know, all you need to change. You need everything that you think you are is wrong. And so for the first time, she can make her own rules. Jay, I'm going to pitch this to you. Uh, hearing that, and I think you probably 
learned that over the course of your work. What is it like for you as the doctor to, in some ways, wrest that control, right? That scene at the end where she, where she essentially says, thank you, but I'm going to decide what I'm gonna do next. What is that like? And then after you answer, I'd love to hear Hank from sort of a practitioner's you know, perspective. What, if anything, did that elicit out of you? I'm actually gonna be bratty and ask you to pass that down. Oh, that's <laughs> Um, Doc Schwartz is actually uh, one of the doctors that really helped me understand what I was doing and then uh, the role. So uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna say some things and then he's gonna repeat what I said because I stole it. <laughs> <laughs> um, Eric Ward, our assistant director, had been uh, had asked this question while we were doing this great kind of two-hour talk together, and he said. Have you ever had anybody leave your care? And there was just something that changed because, you know, and he said when he was younger, he's like 40 now, so like in his 20s, <laughs> when he was first starting out, he said that, uh, you know, it's personal, it's hard at first because you, you spent all these years studying, you spent all of this time working, you're the expert, you know what's going on, and you spent time with them, so how could they not trust you or, or want your help when you're saying that it's not it's not time. So and then, then it, you know you learn how to compartmentalize but I'm like, oh that's the key right there because whatever rock star doctor I am, I feel like it's the first time that I'm dealing with it. And it's it's hard. It's a personal it, I think it's I mean there's there's the fact that she attempts suicide is is one thing, but then it's where you think you've you've helped her and then she decides that no that's enough. That's enough. It's hard, that's a hard thing. But uh, I'm on the road to compartmentalizing. As a doctor, as a um, so, I have been called a paternalist in recovery. Um, with, but let me actually back up from that just for uh, a moment uh, to say that you know, everybody's path has to be their own. And um, in this show, the path that you describe of her basically finding her own way works for her. And um, I, I, don't, I think it would be a mistake to leave the impression that that kind of path works for everybody. Um, she did attempt suicide, um, and she might have died. Um, she uh, didn't, um, and you know, that has to be taken into account. There are moments when um, path somebody may take may be filled with denial, suppression of reality. We, we see that certainly with, with the, main, the main character. And the autonomy which she exerts in this play um, is uh, workable for her at this stage of her journey, but it's not workable for everybody. And so Sometimes hospitals admit people against their will. Sometimes people <coughs> are, are made to feel as though um, what they think and what they want, uh, everybody else you know, knows better. Every now and then, no more than every now and then, um, um, the medical profession and families impose their will when it's necessary. And often lives are saved that way. It, it's uh, not always the case, but um, it is hard, um, and as you say, I said, compartmentalization is important for you know, any professional who really has to balance the protection and preservation of the individual's autonomy and capacity to take their own path with their safety, their lives, um, and uh, the need for treatment. It's a, it's a tough balance. I just want to follow up. Oh, 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 I would like to say oh, go ahead. Okay. Yeah, it, it's just a quick. Go ahead. Then I'll All I, the only thing I wanted to say is that um, when you asked me where is Diana, I can only give the answer that I'm experiencing in my brain. And and doing these talkbacks is actually the first time where, but we've discussed um, 
that I, anything that I say is completely in direct reference to the character that I'm portraying and where she is at that moment and without making any judgment in terms of um, this is, this is, this is the way. This is this is what we. This is the story we're telling, and this is the what what people should do. So I mean, I I just wanted to be clear that you asked me a specific question. Where is Diana? And that's I think why that moment has so much light in it because that's where she is. And I think one of the things that people respond to um, about this production is that you are a voice. You are not saying you are the voice, um, and that kind of personalization I think is what reverberates out to all of you as you watch the show. And just having bipolar myself, I feel like I live your story, Diana. I feel like I am Diana. And uh, what, what it reminded me of and uh, is that all the pain and all the suffering that we do go through. And sometimes I just wish that everybody knew that. And perhaps some of the discrimination that we face trying to get jobs and trying to live our lives, that people actually knew that it was that hard to recover. And I can tell you that when I was diagnosed, the psychiatrist, and it wasn't Dr. Schwartz, <laughs> it wouldn't have been him, said to me, you will never work again. Oh. And this was uh, 30 some years ago, and I have a doctorate in education. And I was thinking, uh, and, and what am I going to do the rest of my life? And uh, I did leave my family, and uh, I'm very proud that my son is with me tonight. And uh, he's the one that bore a lot. He certainly has a lot of uh, pain that he still has to go through because it was a very, very hard journey, very hard journey. And when I first started in Connecticut 30 years ago, talking about hope and recovery, I can tell you people looked at me like, what do you mean recovery? People with mental illness do not recover. 30 years ago, we did not recover. And I can tell you today that I know so many people that work and live and have their jobs and also raise their hand and say, and I have it. And I was speaking with a group of people yesterday, um, 16 young people, and they're like, I love their energy. They're, well, I'm going to go to college. And I said, but, but. You know, and you want me to write you a recommendation, and uh, they know that I'm, um, I've had this this um, uh, mental illness, and they said, well, if they don't want my mental illness, they don't want me, and they certainly don't want my money, <laughs> and I'm applying at Smith, and I did get accepted. So I just think that people are starting to change, and I think that's really great. So. The power of all of us talking about it, but not forgetting that there is a lot of struggle to get to where we are. There is recovery, and there are people all over that do, and in fact, have wonderful, wonderful lives, and, and we need to know that. And um, I'm really very fortunate because I get to now go into the hospital, and I see people who, who it, it, <clears throat> when I see them, it's their first hospitalization, and they look at me, and I say to them, you, know, you do have hope. This is not your life. This is a very small part of your life that you can make into the life that you want. And there's lots of help. There's lots of hope. And we always talk about it, and, and Dr. Schwartz reminded me again of, of that way of recovery. And everybody has that way. We all have our own way. And my way probably is similar to yours, Diane, in a way, but um, I think um, it's my way. And I think that we all have, we choose that and we, and we look for all of that. And, and I think that many of us are starting to look at, are there other things besides hospitals and pills and, and ECT and what else can we find that, that will help us a little bit? And those are the things that we're really looking for. It's wonderful, um, it's wonderful, I love it, I love it. I'm gonna open it up to you guys. We've got a question in the back here, yes. It's actually not a question, it's more of a comment for the performers and it's not about the content of my bowl or the content, I just wanted to, share the feeling that I got from your performance tonight as it was spectacular and here's the reason why for me. Um, for the last six months or so I've been trying to become I've tried to enjoy classical Western opera. And I can't do it. It just it, it does not impress me at all, no matter how hard I try. Tonight I felt like I saw an American opera. It was it was spectacular to see you all singing 
different parts simultaneously <laughs> to each other and to us. I got this emotional connection with the performance that was just splendid. And um, I wanted to share that because I haven't seen any. This, when I read the musical, I thought, you know, cats or something like that. <laughs> no, this was entirely different. It was just delightful. Really wonderful. Thank you. I have to shout out and thank you again in a blue sweatshirt over here. Adam Susan, who is the musical director, who really is the captain of this show. When it comes to the music uh, and, and this opera, um, he has carried these guys so safely um, through this through this story. And, I, and thank you so much for, for that comment. Yes, right here. Recovery is authenticity, and, and I'm sort of going to look at Maya and Christiane for that because I think you both really, uh, and, and, and actually David too, um, you guys so beautifully embody what that means. Um, tell me a little bit about what that um, was like for you, finding those authentic pieces as you were putting the story together. Um, I think for Natalie, hearing that truth from her mother for the first time was really that moment for her where everything started. And then it was kind of like a spiraling effect to a good place because she finally was able to see her parents in a human way. And I think that that's a huge part of her recovery and her growth as a human being and growing up as a young woman in the world. I'm just thrilled you got exactly. Um, I, I, th I think the whole purpose of what Dan and what I'm trying to bring to Dan is a complete family together and to try and do what's best for the family and Diana, uh, not knowing along the way how or what's the best way to do it. That's how I've kind of kept it authentic, I hope, that his driving force is for good and trying, and he doesn't know, there are no rule books as he says that. Uh, no one knows how this pans out, what the rules are. Um, as long as I keep that, then that's where I find the authenticity for me as an actor. For sharing yourselves with us tonight. We look forward to seeing you at the